Hey class, today we're going to be looking at section 1.6 in college algebra. Uh, we are going to talk about how to solve other types of equations than what we've seen before. Uh, we're going to look at polynomial equations with degrees higher than two, uh, mostly degree three and degree fours today. Uh, and then we are also going to look at how to solve square root equations and absolute value equations. All right, so let's get started with some polynomials. We are going to solve these polynomials by factoring. I love factoring. Uh, so this, I'm, I'm going to, of course, do a couple examples um, of each. I'm not going to do all the examples that are in these notes here. So the ones I don't do, you can try on your own and then check our course calendar for the filled in notes to see how you did. All right, so we're going to start with number two here. We have two terms. Anytime we are solving a polynomial equation by factoring, we need to get the equation equal to zero. So the first step is always to move everything over to the same side so that it equals zero. So that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to subtract my 12x squared to both sides. So I have 4x to the fourth minus 12x squared equals zero. Now I can factor and then since it's equal to zero, I can use our zero product property to solve. So here what we're going to look for is just a greatest common factor. So we kind of always want to look for a greatest common factor in our polynomials when we're factoring. If there's something that all the terms have in common that we can factor out, it definitely simplifies things for us. So I can factor out a four and an x squared here, and I'm left with an x squared minus three equals zero. Uh, and then you can factor x squared minus 3, but it has to do with uh, having square roots in the factors, and that's a little weird. So another option is just to jump straight to our zero product property, 4x squared equals 0, and x squared minus 3 equals 0, and then solve each one. Uh, dividing by 4 and square rooting is 0, I'm going to end it. So if x squared equals 0, then x equals 0. There's no other way around that one. Uh, and here, if I solve, I get x squared equals 3, so x equals plus or minus the square root of 3. Don't forget your plus or minus, because when we square something, it could be positive squared or it could have been negative squared, and you get the same thing. All right, so those are our three answers for that problem. It's also good to note uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that the number of zeros or solutions should be the same as your degree. Now this one has a degree of four. I only have three solutions, but really it's four because this one ended up being a double root because x squared was zero. So we had two x's multiplied together to be zero. So technically we have two answers that are both zero. Uh, so I do have my four solutions for my fourth degree function. It's always good to double check your number of solutions with your degree. All right, moving down to example four, we have a cubic equation. Again, my first step is just going to get everything to the same side. 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 8x minus 12 equals zero. So that we have it equal to zero, we can factor and solve. Uh, now, this type of factoring is a little different. We call this factor by grouping. There's a ton of different ways you can do factor by grouping. But one of my favorite methods that my students tend to really like is using a box it's kind of like a little puzzle. And you put all four pieces into the box. So 2x cubed, 3x squared, negative 8x, don't forget those negatives, and negative 12. So we have all the pieces in the box. Our goal is to figure out what goes on the outside of the box so that it all multiplies into the inside correctly and gets you everything you need. So I know based on uh, this row here, if you look across the top row, they both have an x squared term, so I definitely need an x squared term there. Then if I look down this direction, in order to get that first box as 2x cubed, I'm going to need to multiply my x squared by a 2x. And then I can kind of piece together my puzzle from here. 2x times a negative 4 will get me a negative 8x. x squared times a positive 3 will get me a 3x squared. And then double check that that 3 times a negative 4 so I'm talking about this one times this one gives you this one. You always want to double check that that all worked out. And it did. Yay. So we have our two factors. We have 2x plus 3 
times x squared minus four equals zero. Now x squared minus four is a difference of squares. It factors nicely. So I'm going to keep factoring this one into x plus two times x minus two. If you're not sure how I did that, you can go search difference of squares factoring. All right, and then I can use my zero product property to get all or each one of these equal to zero and x minus two equals zero, and then solve. Subtract three and divide by two. I have negative three halves, negative two, and positive two for each one of those. I kind of didn't show the last step there, but hopefully you can follow it. Uh, and it was a third degree function, and I have three zeros, so nothing weird going on here. All right, next we're gonna be looking at solving radical equations, specifically square root equations here. We're just gonna do the first example, and I'm not quite sure what happened with my square roots and why they're doubled, so just try to ignore that. Uh, all right, so the first thing I wanna do is isolate the radical. So to do that, I wanna get this, oh, this positive two over to the other side. Uh, square root of two x minus one equals x minus two. Then use exponents. In this case, we're going to square both sides to get rid of the radical. So we're going to take each side to get rid of a square root, we square it, and then I'm gonna square this whole side too. Now be really careful. When we have a negative or a positive in that expression that's being squared, if it's more than just a single term, uh, we are not allowed to distribute that exponent. So instead, what we have to do, oops, I <laughs> erased my subtraction. What we have to do, so this turns into two X minus one, and then I need to multiply x minus two times itself and foil that out or distribute or use the box method, whatever you need, but multiply that all out. So two x minus one equals, that's gonna give me x squared minus two x minus two x plus four. Now I can get everything to the same side of the equation and see what I can do from here. So it's kind of like we're now at the step where we were in the last couple problems where I wanna get it equal to zero because it's a polynomial and then see if I can factor or what I need to do to solve for this. So I'm going to subtract two X and add one. And then I'm gonna combine all these like terms. I have a lot going on here. So negative two X, I have three of those. So I've got negative six X's and a positive five. This is factorable, thank goodness. If it wasn't factorable, you could use the quadratic formula to solve is another option. So x times x, um, let's see, five times one, and if they're both negative, then they multiply to a positive five and add to a negative six. And then I can use my zero product property. I'm not gonna write it out anymore. I'm just gonna kind of skip. So x equals five and x equals one. Now, here's the kicker. You're not allowed to just box those and say that you're done because we need to check our answers. And I know I didn't talk about checking our answers in the last problem, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So we have, let's just, I'm gonna use this blank space over here. Sorry, I didn't plan enough space. Hopefully you're writing small. Uh, so if I check X equals five, I'm gonna plug that in two times five minus one plus two equals five. So I'm plugging it in both of the X's. So I have the square root of 10 minus one, plus two equals five, that's the square root of nine, plus two equals five, three plus two equals five, yes it does. So five is definitely a solution. Now if I check x equals one, we have the square root of two times one minus one plus two equals one. Square root of two minus one plus two equals one, square root of one plus two equals one, one plus two does not equal one, Nope, it doesn't. So X equals one is actually an extraneous solution, which means it's not an answer. Um, and this happened because, ready for this? Because square root functions have restricted domains. So not all X values, not all real numbers will work for square roots. When we have square roots of negative numbers, we have imaginary numbers uh, and square roots definitely have a starting point on that graph and then go from there and not in all the directions. So always check your answers. I wanna see you check your answers just like I showed here. 
Don't erase your answers that don't work. Just show me that they don't work by putting a little slash through your equal sign. Now, to check or not to check, what a great question. Uh, we, I don't always check my answers. I mean, it's good practice to do that, but it takes a lot of time and sometimes we get a little lazy and don't wanna check all our answers. So here's how to know when to check your answers. You need to check your answers when the function has a restricted domain. So not all real numbers in the domain. So this takes a little bit more in-depth knowledge of each one of your types of functions. Polynomial functions, so x squared functions, x cubed functions, x to the fourth functions, x you know, linear functions, all those polynomials, they're all real number domains. So you really, as long as you didn't do something wrong in your math, um, you don't have to check your answers for polynomials because you're never gonna have extraneous solutions. But square root functions, if I have y equals the square root of x and I graph this thing, it starts here and it goes this direction. My domain is x is greater than or equal to zero. It's not all real numbers. So I have a restricted domain. I have to check my answers because even though we did everything perfectly in that problem, we had a solution that didn't work. Uh, now, other types of equations that we have or will be going through that have restricted domains in this course are going to be uh, rational functions, uh, logarithmic functions, which are one of my favorites. I love logs. Um, and I don't know, that's all that comes to mind right now. There's probably more, but we'll just leave it at that. <clears throat> so there's more than just this one. There are lots of different types of functions we have to check our answers for. All right, so moving on, we have some uh, quartic functions that are in quadratic form. So one of the things I like to do is, and it says using substitution here, I actually decided not to teach it like that and I forgot to erase those pieces. So I'm just going to factor as if it were a quadratic. So I'll use a box method to kind of show you what I mean or what I mean here. So if I have x to the fourth here and negative nine here, what times what is x to the fourth? Well, we have some options. We have x times x cubed or we have x squared times x squared. Um, but because the middle term is an x squared term, we're gonna go with those x squareds. Now I want two numbers that multiply to negative nine and that will give me negative eight x squared on the inside or the middle um, boxes, that other diagonal. So I'm going to use one and nine and I have a nine x squared and a one x squared. And if I want a negative eight x squared, I want my nine x squared to be negative and this one to be positive. So I always try to figure out where my negative goes kind of after I've done the multiplication. Uh, it's just a little easier than just guessing for me. All right, and then I can rewrite my factors, x squared plus one times x squared minus nine. Now, if this had been a quadratic, like, no, I'll just put it over here, note, if I had had x squared minus eight x minus nine equals zero, my factors would have been x plus one times x minus nine. So it's really similar. The only difference is instead of the x's, we have x squareds, which means a couple things we're going to have a lot more work to do. <laughs> uh, and we can actually factor more here. I can't factor x squared plus one. I'll show you why in a second, but I can factor this difference of squares into x minus three times x plus three. Now using my zero product property, x squared plus one equals zero, x minus three equals zero, and x plus three equals zero. Uh, this one, when I get x by itself, I have x squared equals negative one, and then, uh, I'm running out of room again. <laughs> uh, X equals plus or minus the square root of negative one. And based on our 1.4 lesson, we learned about complex numbers. This is plus or minus I. So I do want you to write it in terms of I. We're also going to have X equals positive three and X equals negative three as our solutions. We have four solutions for our fourth degree function. It's a polynomial, so the domain is all real numbers. We don't have to check our answers. They're not restricted domains. I'm gonna leave number two for you guys to try and check your work with the filled in version uh, of our notes on our calendar. 
All right, and the last type of function we're going to go over today is the absolute value function. So just um, a reminder that absolute values, the whole point of an absolute value is to make something positive. So if I have, for example, the absolute value of five, it's going to be five. If I have the absolute value of negative five, it turns it to be positive five. So whatever's inside the absolute value will always become a positive number. Uh, now to solve an absolute value, so for example, if I had the absolute value of x equals five, then I actually have two solutions. I have x could have been five or x could have been negative five because the absolute value would have worked either way. So when we have absolute values, we need to split this into kind of two different equations. One that represents the positive piece. So the absolute value of 11 is 11 and the absolute value of negative 11 is 11. <laughs> So I can set this part inside equal to 11 and equal to negative 11. So, um, so that's going to look like this. 2x minus 3 equals 11 and 2x minus 3 equals negative 11. So we're not actually negating this one here. I mean, we kind of are, but really we're treating it as um, negating that inside 11, the one that was inside the absolute values. All right, and then we can, we can work from here. So if I add three, two X equals 14. So X is seven. And if I add three here, two X equals negative eight. So X is negative four. Notice our answer isn't like seven and negative seven. You do have to solve both equations. Um, absolute value functions look like this and they keep going forever. They have domains of all real numbers. So I do not need to check my answers as long as I didn't make any mistakes. My answers will be just fine. All right, I'm gonna skip number two. You guys can practice that on your own. Uh, number three, we have a little bit more uh, involved in this problem. One thing to note is that absolute values are different than parentheses. You cannot distribute into an absolute value. So instead what we need to do is isolate the absolute value. So that's our goal. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add 15 to both sides. I'm going to have five times the absolute value of one minus four X equals 15. Then I'm going to divide by five absolute value of one minus four X equals three. Now I'm at the same point that I was on the last problem. I can split this into two equations. When you do your split, one minus four X equals three and one minus four X equals negative three. You drop the absolute values at that point. You don't need them. All right, and let's see, negative four X equals two. So X equals negative one half and negative four X equals negative four. So X equals one. So there are two solutions. Now, one more example, this one's a little tricky. Uh, the absolute value of 3x minus 6 equals negative 2. Now, this one is going to throw a curveball at you because if you break it into two equations and solve, you will be wrong. You actually are wrong if you do anything with this equation. This is not, oops, sorry, not possible. You can't have an absolute value be equal to a negative number. The whole point of an absolute value is to make things positive. So you can't take the absolute value of something and make it equal to negative two. So absolute values can't equal negative numbers. It defeats the whole purpose of the definition of an absolute value. So this is just not possible. You can say no real solutions. You can say it's not possible. You can say uh, whatever you need to say to, to get that point across. All right, and that's it for today's lesson.